her pronouns, and I'm the director of new work at Company One Theater. And my name is Africa Sela. I use say them pronouns, and I'm Company One's new work producer and residence, supported by the National New Play Network. We're so grateful to have you join us for In Community We Trust, a digital event featuring readings of responsive short plays by Jonathan Norton, J.C. Pankratz, and Eliana Pipes. As we launch into 2023, we're still carrying the challenges and losses of the last several years with us. In strengthening our collective care practices, what does well being look like now, and how can we uplift and enrich the health of our numerous communities? What kinds of public spaces of care can we carve out for and with one another? Prompted by these urgent questions, each Surge Lab writer has given us a snapshot of a person at a pivotal moment in their life and whose narrative journey helps illuminate the calls to action that we, the audience, can follow towards strengthening our neighborhoods. We paired each play with a conversation featuring Boston-based community partners whose work exemplifies what it means to center well-being and hope. We're really excited to introduce our writers and partners to you. Jonathan Norton is the playwright in residence at the Dallas Theater Center and an affiliated artist with the National New Play Network, where Company One is a core member. This multi-award winning Black queer artist notes, what I do is excavation. I dig up stories that have been buried and speak strongly to the world we live in today. We asked Jonathan to write about the power of food and the role it plays in grief, healing, and building community. Our partners at Comfort Kitchen, Chef Kwesi Kwa and managing partner Bokdala Rai, join us for an in-depth conversation about how small businesses and especially food hubs can be transformational for community well-being. JC Pankratz, having just completed graduate work in Boston, describes themselves as a proud, queer, non-binary, transgender playwright and educator writing genre-defying works about gender, class, trauma, and magic. We asked JC to use their poetic power to explore the shrinking landscape of safe public spaces for queer and trans folks. B. Paul with partner organization Bagley, the Boston Alliance of Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Youth, speaks with us about how Bagley is fighting to carve out these spaces of care and safety in an increasingly hostile political landscape. Eliana Pipes is a multi-ethnic writer, filmmaker, and performer currently based in her hometown of LA after spending several years in Boston. She, like Jonathan Norton, is also an affiliated artist with the National New Play Network. 
She says, I write marginalized characters who have agency, who have complicated desires. I am not writing to give answers, but to ask questions. Eliana's narrative prompt brings us on a journey of the healthcare system, its language and structural barriers, and what it means to forge community care in that landscape. Our partner, Nishira Baril, founder and executive director of the Neighborhood Birth Center, chats with us about how the implementation of public health strategies that advance justice and equity, and how when the pregnant person is centered, that experience has the power to transform and heal individuals, families, and our civic landscape. The artists and partners featured in this program have shared suggestions for action steps we can take towards greater communal well being. Stay tuned to hear more. And now we present to you In Community We Trust. Uncle Sonny's New Lady Friend Joanne by Jonathan Norton. Character, Uncle Sonny, African-American male in his 60s. Place and time, Dallas, Texas, now. Repass, after a funeral. Papa appreciates you come see about him, but don't worry about fixing me a plate. I'm fine with this here water. So all I need is a little sip of water. Mm. Help me cool down. <laughs> You know, I almost cussed out your mama. Laying your granny in the ground and we about to start cussing and fighting. How that shit look? That's why I got up, took my casserole and walked away. But the old me wouldn't have done that. Mm -mm. Old Sonny would have hurt her feelings real bad in front of the whole goddamn family with no regret. Shit. KK, forget who's the father and who's the child. And hey, I, I know KK's hurting. I'm hurting too, we all hurting, but some shit ain't necessary. Ain't right to be ugly and nasty to people like she been. She know her mom wouldn't have gone for that. And just cause you grieving, don't give you the right to treat other people like shit. Innocent people at like that. And hell, Joanne wasn't even in the picture when I was married to Sherelle. So why gonna treat Joanne that way? If KK wanna be mad at somebody, then she needs to be mad at me. Leave Joanne out of the shit. Mm. Mm. Your mama really showing her ass today. You know, she told Joanne she's not welcome at the funeral. Sure did. Mm. I told Joanne KK not running a goddamn thing. But Joanne didn't want to cause no trouble, so she stayed at home. But even after being disrespected, she went out of her way to make this casserole out of the kindness of her heart. Shit, she's a better person than I am. That's just the kind of woman Joanne is. Made all this food and KK gonna turn it away. <laughs> Hey, want to fix you a plate? Eat it when you get home? Smells good, right? And it tastes better than it smells. Want me to fix you a plate? But thank me later. Trust me. Look at this. Mm, look at this. Look at all this goodness. You ain't never seen nothing like this before. Jackfruit enchilada vegan casserole. Let me fix you a plate before you leave. <laughs> Please, baby boy, you got, you got to help your papa out. I, I can't take food back home. Imagine how Joanne going to feel. I walk in the house with all this food left and ain't nobody took a bite. Hmm? This is a goddamn shame. All this perfectly good food going to waste. Your mama wouldn't even let me put this on the buffet line. Some shit about a predetermined menu. You know what you think about that? She said there's a predetermined menu for the repast and they got to stick to it. No exceptions. Well, I saw her predetermined menu. It's a predetermined menu of death and heart disease, and diabetes, and the high blood pressures, and the sugars and cancers. Ain't nothing but poison and sweet tea. And that tea is poison too. All that goddamn sugar. <laughs> Stuffing their faces with all that greasy food. The only edible thing was the mac and cheese, because that's your granny's recipe. Rest that shit ain't fit for a dog. These collards and candied yams. You know who made that shit? Because them greens had a stanky odor, and the yams looked burnt. That dressing will burn too. Well, that goddamn fried chicken. That buffet line made me turn my stomach just looking at it. The folks got the nerve to turn their nose up at my jackfruit enchilada vegan casserole, including you. 
I saw that look on your face. But watch, you young now. One of these days when you get to be my age, all that goddamn grease and fat and salt gonna come back and haunt your ass. I'm a living witness. I should have told KK this dish was from Joanne. What was I gonna do, lie? I don't like lying to my daughter. Hell, KK know when I'm lying. She got too much practice growing up. That's why she's so hateful towards Joanne. Really not KK's fault, but still, Sherelle wouldn't approve of how she's behaving, would she? Oh. Hey, darling. Yeah, I'm hanging in there. Uh, thank you for checking on me. Oh, I'm just sitting here with my grandson. Oh, she's all right. Everybody deal with it in their own ways. You know how it is. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make the motherfucker drink it. <laughs> yeah, I told him I was vegan. Before. Oh, I should have told them Afterwards, oh, fuck. I really hate you putting all that work in it. I wish you the sweetest day. <laughs> I love you too, darling. <laughs> See you real soon. <laughs> this is bullshit. Hell, somebody gonna eat this goddamn jackfruit enchilada vegan casserole. Baby boy, go get your mama. Bring her ass in here. I'm going to give her a good talking to. Go. Go get your mama. Because we about to settle some shit. Don't worry. I ain't going to get loud. We're going to respect your granny. But this shit right here going to get handled. What you want, bet? Uh, and bring me back a little corner of that mac and cheese. You know? okay, just a little corner. Hmm. Hmm. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-
please don't get mad at what I'm about to tell you, but I have a new lady friend. I feel that you have a right to know. Her name is Joanne Salazar. She's a vegan socialist. She believes that God is a woman and that church is another form of oppression. And I think she got a lesbian lover too. She don't believe in monogamy, but I guess I deserve that. But, 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 but before you start rolling over, she's also a farmer. She lives off the land, likes to get her hands dirty. She country girl, like you. Yeah, I knew you'd like that last part. She got a plot of land in Joppy that her daddy left to her and his mama left to him and her daddy left to her. She turned that plot into a community garden. We call it headquarters. She grow her own food and medicine for her neighbors and anyone in need. I ain't never seen nothing like it. She got cabbage and collars and arugula. She got Swiss chard, spinach, kale, eggplant, purple whole peas, six kind of peppers. You hear me, Sherelle, six. She go jalapeno, habanero, chili, banana, red peppers, green peppers. I know you like peppers. Squash, white squash, yellow squash. You name any kind of special squash and she got it. All kinds of tomatoes, watermelons, fruit trees, herbs, roots, you name it. And headquarters was just what my body needed, Sherelle. It saved my life. Year ago, I was in bad shape. Doctor said my heart was about to take me out. They had me on all these medications, but God damn it, them pills made me feel worse. One day there was a knock on my door. You remember my partner, RB? Remember him? He had the Viteglio, the Viteglia, the Viteglia, uh, whatever Michael Jackson had. Well, RB's daughter, Princess, was at my front door. I don't know if you ever met Princess. She used to stay with her mama's people in Little Rock. A anyway, Princess said she knew a lady who could heal me and took me to headquarters. And Joanne got my body, my soul, and my mind right. Doctors took me off all those medications. I got my life back, and I ain't been the same since. You know, I really wish... Folks come as far as Lil Elm. We feed them, heal anybody and everybody. Volunteers pick for free. Neighbors is pay what you can. Everybody else, full press. We start the volunteers off with yoga and breathing exercises. Young and old, strong and frail, it don't matter. You're going to bend something. Sherelle, you should see me doing yoga. <laughs> for the, and for the first time, as we got a tradition, we feed them flowers. Lavender, chamomile, marigold, whatever's was in season. That's how we welcome the headquarters. Joanne's brother works with the at-risk teenage boys. We feed them flowers too. They call me Uncle Sonny. He brings them to the garden one weekend a month to help out and get food to take home to the families. And it was rough at first. There was a bunch of knuckleheads. Reminded me of those roughnecks we used to chase away from KK. And I pegged them real good. They were trying to do a bit of work. One day, this boy, Amiri, started calling Joanne out her name. Mm, Sherelle, you know what that did to me. I got that boy backed up in a corner. I got in his face, told him to apologize. Then he hauled off and take a swing at me. But she, this old man fooled his ass because I'm not Popeye. I've been eating my spinach. I snatched that little boy up by his collar, started swinging his ass around, threw him into the rutabagas. And all them little fellas knew not to fuck with Uncle Sonny no more. So check this out. A few Sundays later, Amiri came back to apologize. And he brought his granny. He picked fresh vegetables. It was her 80th birthday. Amiri fed his granny hibiscus. A few weeks later, she made her transition. I took Amiri to the men's warehouse to buy him a suit for his granny's home going. There's not a lot of men in his mama's people's side, huh? Never seen that before. His mama asked me to sit with the family. Now I'm Uncle Sonny for real, practically. <laughs> I think baby boy would have been a good influence on him, Mary. Sherelle, I wish. I really wish. <clears throat> I really wish you could have made it to pick chamomile with me. <clears throat> oh, and butterflies. 
I forgot the butterflies. We, we raise butterflies too. KK. Put it on the burners first. It ain't good cold. End of play. Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to be Hello, I am so glad to be joined by Chef Kwesi Kwa and managing partner Bipla Rai, who form one half of the ownership team of Boston's soon to open Comfort Kitchen. It is a cafe by day and a restaurant by night, celebrating global comfort food, the flavors and ingredients of the African diaspora connected from Asia to the Americas. Comfort Kitchen is a black owned, immigrant owned and woman owned business. Kwesi and Bipla and the whole team are extremely accomplished. So we encourage you to visit comfortkitchenbos.com as well as the event page for this program on the Company One website to read their full bios. So food, it has the power to connect us, to surprise us, to lead us on journeys into the past and towards the future. And our guests today know that intimately. Comfort Kitchen's mission states, we believe that food is a vital aspect of community building. We envision a place that is actively engaged in the celebration of art and the history of our local community. We are seeking to partner with individuals, groups, and organizations who wanna make a positive impact. So welcome to Company One and to this event, Crazy and Bipla, it's really lovely to have you. Pleasure Thank to you. be here. Um, I wanna start with the word comfort. So. Obviously, not only is your new restaurant called Comfort Kitchen, but your historic building that you will be opening in is situated in Dorchester's Upham's Corner neighborhood. And the building began its life in 1912 as a comfort station, a rest area for folks who traversed the city using the growing streetcar system. What is important to both of you about this location for what it is you wanna do? Well, it, the first point is it's in the neighborhood that we live and work in. Uh, also, it's a historic building. It has a very significant uh, in city of Boston's history in terms of transit and comfort station. <laughs> um, you know, it just seems like we are going backwards in 2023 because we don't have any public restrooms. But back in 20, 1912, we had public restrooms. So uh, there's something to talk about that part. Yeah, go ahead. Did you think you want to I, add? I, I think he covered that whole whole section. It's everything that you know he said. Um, so what one of the things that struck me, I didn't know this until recently, um, but obviously your building uh, is both basically on top of the Dorchester North Burying Ground. Um, it's one of Boston's oldest cemeteries, and I I didn't know until quite recently that it's one of the very few where graves of enslaved people are actually marked. Um, I'm struck that in this play that we are in dialogue with, um, that the food, the funereal food is almost its own character. Um, mm -hmm. So that brings me to the, to the idea of comfort food. Um, you are thinking about comfort food in different ways mm -hmm. than I think what perhaps other restaurant goers may be thinking about with, when they hear those words. Um, you know, for me, I, I definitely think about comfort food as something that, you know, I think of when I need care or when I want to connect with something from my past or from a lineage. How are you thinking about comfort food? Oh, um, I think, you know, in general, when folks, especially in the American context, when folks think about comfort food is generally very focused on um, Southern American comfort food, right? Um, which is all good in itself, but realistically, America is such a melting pot of so many different cultures that what comfort food is to one might be the complete opposite to the other. And one of the things that we wanted to kind of move 
one, we wanted to move the needle a little bit to kind of broaden that horizon, but also thread that same needle through the different cultures that food has traveled and ingredients have traveled and, you know, cooking methods that are very synonymous to different cultures and different regions of the world correlate in terms of um, travel and trade and, you know, trade with both human, human trade and, you know, commodities trade, specifically the Maritime Silk Road. And those are kind of what we're focusing on when we talk about the African diaspora and how it connects to Asia and the, and the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, adding to what Kwesi says, I think another big component for us in terms of comfort food is uh, immigrant food, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times immigrant food is excluded from this kind of discussion. Um, you know, when we think of immigrant food, our expectation is very different than your regular, right. you know, let's say Italian food, which also is immigrant food. Right. Um, so what we are trying to do is definitely, you know, food that we can relate to, like you talked about earlier, when we think about homeland, mm -hmm. when we think of family, and when we want to connect, we always go back to cooking our favorite meal that your grandmother made or your mother made. Uh, and that's a big component. And, you know, United States being a very immigrant uh, focused nation, I think that's the discussion we almost certainly don't talk about. And especially given in terms of like restaurant and, uh, you know, hospitality industry is run almost entirely by immigrants and the stories of immigrants are never forefront. And I think specifically when it comes to black and brown immigrants, one of the things that, you know, the food industry has always been so heavily Euro Eurocentric that some of those stories have very much been lost. And a lot of times when folks think about black and brown immigrant food, the expectation is low quality or an, an excessive abundance, but cheap, you know, and we're, just, we're really trying to change that narrative as well. Because food is a path to connection and we are living in uh, some disconnected times. Uh, I'm curious for the both of you, um, if you were to, if you were to offer some action steps for somebody um, around paths to connection, food involved or not, right? What are some things for you that you, you want to offer as an action step for folks? Uh, it could be about, um, you know, being connected up through food. It could be about uh, something in neighborhoods. It could be something really small or really big. But what feels important to you right now when, you, when people are taking action to make their world better? Sure. I think we lost you for just a bit. Ah. But I think we got the gist of the question. Great. Um, like what would, can, can you repeat that question? Yeah, I sure can. Um, so if you were to offer some action steps mm -hmm. to folks yeah. who are thinking about how to reconnect in small and large ways, mm -hmm. uh, this could be food related or not, but for folks who want to make their world better, um, for you, what, what are some things that, that are important to you right now? What are some action steps you might take or that you want to see other people take? Absolutely. Um, for me, I think, you know, personally, a lot of transplants or people that don't know Boston or don't, don't live in Boston when they come in, it's like, there's a long, it's, it's a, there's a deep history. So know the history first, right? Know your neighbors and not just, you know, I mean, you got to go and read about it. You got to know the folks that's living there instead of bringing your perceived idea into a community and then pushing that agenda. Uh, you know, and that gets into gentrification, and that's why gentrification is, <laughs> you know, it's it's evil in its own ways because it's pretty much a different version of colonization. Right. Um, so th that's important for me. Like, if I were to move in a new neighborhood, that's what I would do. I would, you know, would want to know who's living next door, get to know them, go for food, go to cafes. Mm. Um, in terms of like restaurant and you know food spaces goes, you know, similar thing. It's like, don't just visit the cafes and restaurants and places that are glorified in the media or has like, you know, a million followers on Instagram, go to places that don't have that uh, support, try out, even if it's not nice, but give it a shot or go there a couple of times. Maybe the first time somebody's working and they were in, you know, different mood and something wasn't happening. So give people a second chance. Don't just, you know, 
cut them off because you're like, hey, I saw it on Instagram and this is not the food that I <laughs> that I saw or people talking about it. Um, that's what I would do. But uh, yeah, crazy. You know, as I'm listening to him talk, it's um, everything he said right now encompasses, you know, so in our business, in our restaurant, we operate by a three, C, three C's model. And it's, you know, community, cross-cultural understanding and collaboration. And realistically, when you put that into the context of a neighborhood, that's everything he just said, you know, and Rita and I, when we travel, it doesn't matter where we go. We don't stay at a hotel. We stay at an Airbnb and we make sure we're in a neighborhood that we're, you know, we're not, we're visiting literally local places as a food adventure, you know? And to me, that's where I find, and I think a lot of times I find that people miss out on that kind of communal experience that food brings by going to, you know, the most celebrated place where it's, Essentially, it's really just a food experience and not really a community-based experience, you know, and that's what we're trying to kind of build out of this restaurant where you, you're coming for, yes, a food experience for sure, but the story and the, the history that's behind that food experience, because in theory, what connects people through food is based on that cultural attachment to the food. Mm. And we're trying to bring those cultural attachments in every dish that we do. And that's what I would like, you know, those three C's, I think for us as a business too, we we operate by it. I always make the joke, we're, we're a friends and family business and that's real. Like Biblos mom is downstairs <laughs> right now, you know? So it's it's, I think that's what I would encourage folks to do is really look beyond the aesthetic of whatever community you're in and really dive deep into the stories and the cultural understandings that's, you know, that pushes the mechanics of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that resonates so deeply with me. Uh, and I can tell you that we are so grateful to have y'all as neighbors in the work we do in this city. Um, we admire the heck out of out of your food and the way you roll. So thank you for, for continuing to bring that spirit and, and that nourishment into our communities with us. Thank you so much for being here. And I wish you all the best on the opening of the new space. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. What's next? What you want? What's next? What you want? What's next? Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to begin. I had to tell my mom the cloud isn't a cloud. I'm over at her house doing the chopping, not logs, onions. Her wrists aren't so good anymore. She has a government issued 20 year old PCA. He usually does it, but he was sick. Of course he was sick because it was Allium day. Scallions, shallots, red onions, yellow onions, white onions. And she's got to watch. Pash, make the dice a little smaller. Pash, half moons. That's a slice. A slice is different from a half moon. No, 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 let me look it up. I said, I'm looking it up. What's my password for the New York Times? Meanwhile, I'm openly weeping into a Tupperware. Full snot, full tears. The air is like if you set a Denny's on fire. Just acrid. I didn't even know what that word really meant until Allium Day. But of course I know her password. She hasn't changed it since 2011. I said, Ma, change your password. And she looked at me like I was, I don't know, a plebe chopping onions. Anyway. I was like, it's your data. It has to be password protected. You know, the two go together. Passwords are about doors and making sure they only open for you. So like, let's change the key every once in a while, okay? She rolled her eyes at me. If I had tried to roll my eyes, a thousand onion molecules would have slid up and penetrated my brain through my cornea before farting directly into my neurons. 
Oh, Pash, she said. What do you know about safe? Who cares? Isn't it all just up in the cloud? It's taken care of. It's fine. It's up there. And then she waved her hand around, twiddling her fingers like she was saying hi, girl, to Princess Diana in heaven. Up there. Up there. Up where, dude? In the mountains? In the fucking airplane zone? <laughs> I forgot the word sky for a second. Jesus Christ, this long COVID shit is too real. The thing is, my mother, the least spiritual person, no sense of delight, of whimsy, imagination. Life is short, then you're worms. When I was a little kid, I would be like, oh my God, last night I dreamed about Ken making out with my Barbie's horse. And she would be like, it wasn't real and walk the fuck away immediately. It was crazy. Mom, last night in my dream, I was a banana. It wasn't real. I got all D's and all my teeth fell out and laughed at me. It wasn't real. And then when I grew up, you know, dream or even, maybe only a joke or a thought too wild and she just clear her throat. <clears> throat> Oh man, I had the weirdest dream. <clears throat> I was giving birth to a can of soup. <clears throat> but the same woman, my mother, thought every picture she took on her cell phone, every email she dictated into Google, and every pumping the air emoji was just drinking tea together in the solar system, whirling about, ascended. I should have just said, no, Ma. It's buildings of servers in Montana that are slowly burning the earth alive. But it hurt. It doesn't make sense, but I don't have other words, it hurt. Yeah, worse than the onions. The internet is a terrible place, but honestly, I think it's where I was born. On these fucking forums for the 2009 Star Trek reboot where I met this one other baby, maybe trans kid who had compiled, I shit you not, about 26,000 words of evidence on why Zachary Quinto portrayed Spock through a transmasculine lens. It was an absolute bunker of teenage hysteria. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. We talked all night. Vulcan ears and soft core pon far porn and late night live journal wormholes and what it meant to be gentle or rough and to want everything on offer. I mean, I had nobody, nobody. When I got my period at school, I would wrap two sweatshirts around my waist instead of asking a nurse for a pad. But when I was talking to my trans mask Spock truthers and we were lamowing and it was, it was like, odd. Or missed, faint, but technically tangible, real. Your breath making clouds in the cold. That's how different it was from being around other people. And when I sat on my 200 fucking hoodies in the back of study hall with nobody in a mile wide radius to talk to, instead of just wishing I was dead, I would close my eyes and imagine or remember or I don't know. And that feeling, that fog was settle on me as though the ceiling tiles had parted and all our dumb little chats falling, fluttering, cold, piling on my arms and hands and face. 
snow. Like the most beautiful snow. And that, that was the only peaceful place for such a long time. And the thought that my mother actually had that kind of cherubic golden place inside her or the idea of it inside her all this time and instead it's just <clears throat> but we could have had that the same dream between us we could have found it mapped it sat on its shore watched the sun rise or the fog roll in Instead, just hash. What do you know about safe? But that something in her voice, that's just, it's just aimed, you know? She knows what she's saying because I guess if safe is about doors, then safe is about choice. Password, trans onion boy, dollar sign, dollar sign, 923. Password, Friday night dykes at the keyhole. Password. Why are you lying down in the lion's mouth, dressed in drag as a steak? Like it wasn't hard enough going fucking outside? So today, it hurt. Her social security number is chilling with jet blue and biblically accurate 16 eyed angels, completely safe from the clutches of the dark web. Clouds are safe places for normal people's information. The same grace isn't extended. It isn't on offer. And then she very carefully scrolled just an inch or two up. Hmm, a slice is lengthwise. A half moon is a cross. And I said, Ma, I'm so sorry, but I have to tell you about this dream I had. The thing is, the dream had a smell. Fucked up, right? Dreams don't smell. And this one just reeked. Holy shit, like fossilized, sulfuric goat turds. My tears were white vinegar, full wash, full snot. The sky blacked out by smoke. My friends and I were there. Outside at night, a terrible decision. We were drunk on vodka sodas. I knew I lost my fake ID and that I didn't have the 50 bucks to replace it, but that was a tomorrow past problem because tonight was early 2000s toga night. And a holy fitted sheet was wrapped around my body with my favorite belt, the one with the buckle that said that I made myself out of wire. Work hard, fuck harder. And we were dancing. No shoes, I had to piss so bad, but they were playing Creed and I couldn't stop fucking laughing. Like I was crying so for tears of salt, laughing and we were dancing. You have to dance to Creed. Like you danced alone when you were a little kid with big arms, big circles, a lot of heart, a lot of passion. And then a volcano erupted in the distance cleared its charcoal throat, flung out its arms in a thousand red rivers of exasperation and spat, sneezed hunks of burning magma into the handkerchief of our lives. The air caught fire. Our clothes burned. Crusted ground obsidian, winter layers of pumice mud, and we held hands and spun, singing louder, mascara running, and the fiery grit pelted the skin, and the lava rippled the ground, 1.5 million tons of molten rock per second. Thick dust from the center of the earth, tephra gas eruption plume blotted out the sun as every dog and dude and man died in their earthen houses, burned alive. As the ash cloud rested its palm on the mouth of the world, our arms cast beautiful shadows in the flame light. The dust flakes whirled through the air, 
battened by our slow, exquisite orbits. I opened my mouth for gray snow to home on my tongue. And when I woke up, I woke up singing. Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to begin. I'm so glad to be joined by B. Paul from Bagley, the Boston Alliance of LGBTQ plus youth. B is an engineer who's been part of the Boston community since 2021 and is a huge advocate for equity and opportunity for queer and BIPOC people. To learn more about them, you can find their bio on their website. Bagley, founded in 1980, is a youth-led adult supported organization committed to social justice and the creating, sustaining, and advocating for programs, policies, and services for the LGBTQ plus youth community. This conversation is taking place as part of Company One Theater's digital event in Community We Trust and is connected to a brand new short play by C1 Surge Lab writer, J.C. Pankratz called Yes, Virginia, Trans People Danced Under Mount Vesuvius. In this play, we meet Pash, a 20-something trans person caring for an aging person who sees magic in technology and the internet and data clouds, but can't seem to imagine the reality of a world where Pash can exist in safety. At Bagley, P B. Paul serves as a host homes peer leader working to address LGBTQ plus youth homelessness in Massachusetts for youth ages 18 to 24 years old. I am so excited to chat with you, B, as Bagley supports Boston's LGBTQ plus community and beyond through extensive interpersonal uh, programming that offers identity-based social support groups, mental and behavioral health programs, a walk-in clinic, and really a space of community. In JC's uh, play, we get a sense of how deeply important programs like this are for communal and personal well-being. B, can you tell us more about Bagley and how the work you do through the Home Host program? Of course. Um, so glad um, to be a part of this conversation. Um, and Bagley really came to me um, in a time where I was seeking like friendship and community. Um, and so I think um, the ways that Bagley really supports community building, um, especially in Boston, are by offering a lot of the things that you mentioned, um, things like identity-based resource groups and meetings, um, like offering um, health advocacy um, and resources, offering mental wellness support um, by offering programs like host homes where they support people that are experiencing housing insecurity um, by being able to support people that might be experiencing food insecurity. Host homes also works on teaching youth life skills. Um, so things like um, credit scores and how to maintain them or banking or food shopping or how to be a good roommate. Um, and so I think that just the plethora of programming um, and opportunities that Bagley offers um, allows it to be um, a really moving um, and important um, community space in Boston. That is so amazing, V. And, and kind of tying to that, especially um, for folks interested in learning more about Bagley, you can visit their website after this event. Um, there's this thread around um, how community is a form of survival, and you spoke to the many ways, especially around um, serving as a space to learn life skills. Um, and so I'm curious if you could speak more to why communal spaces like Bagley are important and what impact do they have for youth and elders in the community? Yeah. Um, so I had written some notes um, because I thought that this was such um, a great question. Um, and I think that um, a lot of times there, um, what happens is that as more community spaces are built, there is more space for people to come in and try and like harm and destroy those spaces. And so I think that um, what's really important and necessary for spaces like Bagley is to um, incorporate um, things like mental wellness, um, security, um, and mindfulness of your peers. Um, and so I think that um, it's important for 
spaces like Bagley to incorporate mental wellness um, and wellness in general. So um, things like including resources for um, therapy. Bagley has Tea Time, which is um, a, there are two um, queer therapists that um, are available um, to listen to queer youth. Um, they also have peer mental wellness meeting, um, which is a great resource for people to come in as a group and discuss mental wellness. Um, I think in terms of safety, um, it's really important as a community um, to take accountability for protecting each other um, and also protecting people when they're in your space. So something that I really like that Bagley does is um, something that is really small, but um, on the entrance in the entrance way to Bagley, there um, the door is initially locked and you ring the doorbell to you know get in. So somebody comes and um, they see who you are, they know you or um, and then they let you into the space. And I think that that's really important. Um, and then when it comes to mindfulness, um, I think that's taking accountability for your words and your actions and being aware of the other individuals in the space. So being mindful of things like your privilege, um, the places that you come from, the way that they impact your um, outlook on life um, and um, bringing those thoughts um, and that thoughtfulness into conversations with other people that are in your space because it's meant to be a safe, safe space for them as well. And not to say that it shouldn't also be a brave space, a space where people can have sort of difficult conversations um, and talk through some of the issues that are impacting the community. Um, so I think those are just a couple of things that um, make a really good community space. Um, and I think especially accountability um, for and with each other, um, because that is what community is all about as a space, as a means of survival um, community, we need to be accountable um, and hold ourselves accountable for each other. Yeah, I'm in full agreement, especially like as we're again, navigating these spaces and, and you really touched point to um, how care takes so many different forms, like whether it's, you know, we realize it on a conscious level or a subconscious level. And so speaking to that, uh, Bagley's specific well-being work with LGBTQ plus communities is an integral part of the broader citywide communal well-being. These are, like you're pointing to, are interconnected and not separate. Um, attached to that, also speaking to current events surrounding policies and unfortunate attacks in the community, um, as well as this other piece of being a safe state for many, many LGBTQ plus individuals and families of LGBTQ plus youth. Um, could you speak to what are some action steps that we can recommend to folks who want to support sustaining safe spaces uh, for LGBTQ plus of all ages? Mm, absolutely. Um, I like that you included of all ages, because Bagley is a space that focuses in on um, people that are 25 and under, but it's absolutely necessary to have spaces for people that are young, people that are older, um, people in every demographic. Um, and so um, I think that steps that people can take to maintain those spaces, um, I think that one thing that I um, have come to learn more about um, and appreciate more is the, the idea of things like mutual aid. I think that that is really important because organizations um, that are established are really great, but there are individuals that, um, there are individuals and communities that um, are not necessarily recognized like Bagley, which is a great and large organization. Um, and those communities still deserve support and they still deserve community. So thinking in terms of mutual aid and contributing to individuals or communities that you know aren't necessarily big and recognized um, because sometimes these bigger spaces don't necessarily cater um, in the ways that they need to, to those individuals. Um, I think other ways that individuals can really support um, creating and maintaining um, queer spaces um, and spaces in the community um, are by um, learning and educating themselves, um, taking the time to read and listen to um, others in the community about their experiences, um, figure out their own experiences and the reasons that they think about some of the things that they do and respond in the ways that they do. Um, and I think also um, making space for 
uh, people that are queer um, in your spaces, if they would like to be in those spaces. Um, so I think I, I can speak from um, like a corporate standpoint. Um, I went to work um, and there was a great need for um, community building and spaces for um, underrepresented groups. Um, and so um, really the ask and the continuous ask is that space is made for us um, and not that decisions are made for us, um, but space is made for us so that we're able to decide for ourselves, um, you know, what we would like our um, community group to look like or um, what we would like benefits to look like for us. Um, so I think making space um, is really, really necessary um, and it's um, yeah, an integral part um, of community building um, as like the greater Boston community. Um, yeah, so I think those are just a few things um, and easier said than done, I think, but um, definitely necessary. Yes, thank you so much, V, for those amazing action steps. And also thank you so much for your time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you. Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to begin. The Waiting Room by Eliana Pipes. I hate hospitals, hate them. There's this smell hospitals have. I think it's whatever they use to sterilize everything or otherwise it's the smell of that white powder on latex gloves. Maybe it's just some chemical they use to barely cover up the smell of death. It's just swirls into the air and makes this stale, sickly, disgusting smell. It smells like fear. I dreaded this appointment all week. Dreaded getting ready, dreaded getting into my car, and now I'm here, still dreading it. Like the worst part, the waiting room. I already checked in, it's too late to run away, and now all there is to do is stew in anticipation. Ooh, stew would be good for dinner, maybe beef stew. I'd rather be anywhere but here. I'd rather be chopped up into stew myself than be in this clinic today. <laughs> but there's nothing to do but sit here and wait for my name to be called. Except it won't be called. Not really. My family is from Somalia. My parents came to America as refugees during the Civil War. I was born here in Boston two years after they arrived, but even though I was an American, they wanted me to have a proper African name. So they called me Fazia Galal Omar. Fazia is my given name and Galal and Omar are from my father and his father. And listen, I think it's a beautiful name. Fazia means triumph, but it also means that when it's my turn to go in for my appointment, the same thing happens every single time. The nurse will come out the door into the waiting room, and then look down at the name on the clipboard, and then all of a sudden, the blood drains out of their face. <laughs> their heart drops down into their asshole. Their life flashes before their eyes because they realize they have to try and pronounce my big African name. And before any syllables come out, they make this sound, this sound, like, the little agitated whine that a child makes before a tantrum comes on. And that's how I know they mean me. The ooh. That's how I know it's my turn to get health care. <sighs> Same goes for substitute teachers and Starbucks baristas. Soon as I cross the threshold of a coffee shop, my name becomes Emily. Nobody's heart drops into their asshole when it's time for Emma to get her chai latte. Wow, I would give the world for a chai latte, but I 
can't have the caffeine. I'm pregnant. This is my 20 week visit. Here to see an obstetrician, possibly the most aggravating kind of doctor's visit there is. Nobody's doing cartwheels about a speculum, are they? Nobody comes in jumping for joy about being bare ass on the paper to spread their legs under the fluorescent lights. Good God. But I've got at least four more months of these appointments coming. Four more months of hospital fumes to inhale. So I figure I better get used to it. Better get used to that little ee sound before a toddler's tantrum too. I'm sorry. I know I'm complaining. I'm not usually this negative, not this negative. Hospitals just make me jumpy. They always have. It started when I was little. I am, um, well, let me back up. One day when I was about 10 years old, my mother woke me up real early in the morning before sunrise even. And she told me we were going on a trip. She needed my help with English. I have an older brother, three years older. He was born in Mogadishu. His Somali was much better than mine. So usually he was the family translator. But today, for some strange reason, I was chosen. <laughs> my family didn't have a car then. So we had to walk to the bus at the break of dawn and the cold climbing over dirt stained snowbanks. It took us three buses to get to the closest hospital. So what would have been a, a 25 minute drive took us an hour and a half instead. All the way there, my mother seemed strange. She was twisting in her seat. I was mostly trying to stay awake, feeling bitter that I'd miss my Sunday cartoons. You know, I wondered what the code dame kids next door were up to while I was sitting on the bus. But finally, finally, we arrived. I helped my mother check into the emergency room at the front desk, and then we waited. And waited, and waited, and waited. No wonder I hate waiting rooms. I thought the bus was bad. We sat there five hours before anyone came to see her. Five hours. My mother twisted in her seat. She was wincing two nails into the chair. She couldn't understand why everything was taking so long. In Somalia, when you go to the hospital, someone sees you right away. It's a very efficient process. You go, you speak with the doctor, get your medicine, you go home. It's different, obviously. There are different levels of resources, but waiting for hours and hours like we did, it was unheard of for her. We thought there must be something wrong with the hospital, that there must be some kind of emergency shortage of doctors. Surely, if someone has to wait more than 30 minutes, there must be a catastrophe going on. It shows you how little we understood about American healthcare. But finally, someone came in to see her, and I shuffled into the appointment room with her, and the doctor came in, this old man with tired eyes. He might have seen 50 people that day. And my mother was wearing her hijab. It was her favorite one too, bright orange. But as soon as the doctor laid eyes on her, this look just washed over his face. I'd seen the look before when Americans meet my mother and I knew what he was thinking, that judgment was just sitting there on the surface. There's no mistaking it. He was thinking foreigner. But I was trying to focus because I knew that this was my big moment, time to translate, to help this man in the white coat understand my mother, to help him understand her pain. He asked me questions. I asked them to her, she answers, and I tell him what she said. So what are you experiencing? Pain, lots of cramping, blood in her urine, pain between her legs like it's burning. Suddenly, I realized why I'd been called in to translate instead of my brother. How long has this been going on? Weeks, but it's gotten worse and worse. More blood, more, more pain. My mother has been in pain for weeks. How much blood? Are there clots? Are there ulcers? 
the doctor seems annoyed about having to wait for me to hear the question, to ask my mother to translate her reply. You know, he taps his foot, asks questions faster and faster, like that's gonna make me speed up somehow. Can't he tell she's scared? Can't he tell I'm scared? He transfers us to another doctor and we weave through the halls of this massive hospital, another waiting room, another list of impatient questions. And again, and again, like cattle being herded, so many rooms, so many faces. The sun is almost going down now. It, it's been all day, we still have no answers. I don't understand why nobody is helping her. Even just walking down the hall, she's wincing. Every step, she gets this shoot of pain. She, she's shaking. I think she's running a fever. She's in pain. My mother is in pain. Can't they see it? And this whole time, she can barely look at me. I know she's ashamed. In Somalia, her family was very religious. And to them, being sick, it, it's interpreted as a sign from God. If you got sick, God wanted you to get sick and it's not in your control or the doctors. If it's God's will, there's nothing anyone can do. And an illness and an affliction, it's like a mark on your soul, a curse. That's why she waited so long to come to the doctor, waited until it was so excruciating she could hardly move. The end of this long, long day, we get a diagnosis. It was an infection, a serious one. It, it spread to her blood and her kidneys. When she was growing up, she was cut. She was 10 years old, like me, just, just a little girl. She was cut. And it led to chronic infections like the infection she had that day. It was almost septicemia. It could have killed her. They put her on an IV until the chill stopped and she was stabilized and they gave her antibiotics to take. And then they sent us home. When we got back on the bus, it was after dark, it took two hours to get back. And on the whole ride, the only thing she said to me was that she was afraid of how much the hospital bill would cost. Once we got home, we never discussed it again. Not once. I'll never forget that day. I know it was just one day. I know that. <laughs> and the antibiotics worked. My mother survived. And really, knowing everything I know now, it could have been worse. It, it could have gone so much worse. At least we got there in time. At least somebody. Listen, even if it was the fifth doctor. That sort of thing. It just stays with you. A few years after that, I had to go get a physical so I could play varsity soccer at my high school. The appointment was at that same clinic. My stomach was in knots the whole way there. <laughs> I hate hospitals. I still hate hospitals. Hated them ever since that day. I don't want my baby to be afraid of going to the doctor. I don't. I don't, I don't want my baby to be afraid of anything. I don't want them to go into the world feeling like the world is set against them. I don't know. But it's hard, you know, to get past something like that. Then they finally call my name. Fazia Galal Omar. Perfectly. Oh, shit. She pronounced my big African name perfectly. Fazia Galal Omar rolled off her tongue like it was chai latte for Emily. <laughs> that has never happened before. I follow her back through the halls of the appointment rooms and I can hardly believe my eyes. It turns out my doctor is an African woman too. 
my doctor is a West African, not Somali, but I can forgive her for that. Then suddenly the hospital smell doesn't bother me so much anymore. I don't even mind the speculum or, or the sanitary paper or the fluorescent lights. She knows my name. She smiles at me. She has kind eyes. She's patient with me. She listens to my questions. She lets me know what to expect before she starts the exam. She sees me. She really sees me. She does the 20 week ultrasound and it turns out I'm having a baby girl. Maybe she'll be a doctor one day too, or a dancer or a barista, whatever she wants. She won't be afraid of anything. Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to be. Hello, we're joined now by Nashira Barrell, the founder and executive director of Roxbury's Neighborhood Birth Center, with a planned opening in 2024. She is also the co-founder of Birth Center Equity, a channel for resources to increase access to community birth center care during COVID-19 and to create a vibrant, lasting community birth center infrastructure across the country. Um, so Nashira's professional and personal biographies are intertwined as she comes from a line of midwives and activists. And you could read more about her story at neighborhoodbirthcenter.org, as well as on the event page for this program on the Company One website. We are thrilled to be in conversation with you, Nashira, as a companion piece to Eliana Pipes' play, The Waiting Room, which follows the story of Fauzia, an American-born woman whose parents arrived in Boston as Somali refugees. Fauzia is at an obstetrics appointment, 20 weeks pregnant, and is girding herself against the hostility she often expects in these medical settings. Um, the play throws into stark relief something that we know that you hold as a deep truth, that humane, culturally informed care for birthing people is tied to our larger fights for a just world and for whole community well-being. In fact, the vision for Neighborhood Birth Center lays it out really clearly on your website. You've said that, I'm going to quote you here, our work is guided by the belief that the world we want to live in from a healthy family to a healthy planet requires the reimagination of healthcare and the equitable redistribution of capital to birth a just and bright future and change the course of maternal health. Birth centers, especially those led by people of color must be invested in at scale. Neighborhood Birth Center is about people at the margins, redesigning healthcare in ways that improve experiences and outcomes for all. So welcome, Nishira. We are so glad to have this chance to talk with you. So I want to start with why are birth centers important? Um, yeah, why are birth centers important to you? Um, thank you, Lana. It's really nice to be here. Um, birth centers are important because um, the majority of people who give birth uh, in hospitals in this country are actually low risk and could really safely be tended to by midwives in community-based settings. Um, unfortunately, many communities um, do not have birth centers. There are about 400 birth centers in this country. And um, unfortunately, they, our, our current model relies on an individual mid, midwife seeding the birth center with their personal savings um, or taking out a mortgage. And so access to birth centers is inequitably distributed. And birth centers are important because they bring midwifery back to community. And, um, you know, not so long ago, one or two generations ago, midwives caught arguably all the babies uh, in community settings and at home. And um, what we know from the data is that birth centers are safe. They provide um, better outcomes and they actually um, lend cost savings back to the healthcare system. And so 
part of our work is to really reclaim the power of midwifery and community birth and to integrate birth centers into the healthcare um, landscape, into the infrastructure, knowing that some folks, you know, will need to access hospital for some reasons, um, but many of us can birth safely outside of the hospital. And in doing so, as someone who gave birth um, at home twice, I can say that there's um, an incredible amount of agency and power that comes with that experience that for me has completely transformed my life now nine and five years um, after each of my home births. So I am a different person. I walk through the world with a different sense of power and possibility because of the ways I was supported by midwives and because I gave birth on my own terms. I know that um, one of the um, the things that is true about Neighborhood Birth Center is that it is, um, the vision for it is that it is part of a landscape that also involves hospital birth. It is, um, it's of a piece with a total healthcare um, experience for communities. I also know that Massachusetts uh, has very little access to this kind of resource. Can you tell us about what the state of birth centers are for Massachusetts and for Boston? Yeah, it's pretty abysmal um, in, a, in a state and in a city as renowned as Massachusetts and Boston for our healthcare. Um, folks are sometimes surprised to hear that there is one birth, one community birth center in the state. It's out in Western Mass, Seven Sisters. And um, the two hospital owned birth centers, um, one recently closed and one has remained temporarily closed for the last three years. It, in the last eight years that I've been working on this project to bring a birth center to Boston, and I wanna acknowledge that it's a, it's a age old vision that uh, belongs to midwives and elders um, who have been imagining this for you know, 30, 40 years uh, for Roxbury and for Boston. And um, I came along uh, about eight years ago and kind of asked their blessing to, to carry it uh, this length of the way. And um, one of the things that uh, I've studied in the last eight years is like, what is going on? Why, are, why do some states have an abundant amount of birth centers, um, Texas, California, Alaska? Um, and why does Massachusetts only have one? And I think the answer really lies in uh, very antiquated state regulations, uh, that in this state, our regulations um, desperately need to be revisited and aligned with the national standards. And unfortunately, they just create uh, significant barriers that many individual midwives, and again, that's who generally is, is starting up birth centers, um, who are managing a, a practice while trying to, to work on creating a birth center, that um, they're really creating a lot of barriers, both financially in terms of the time um, required, and they require, for example, midwives to practice under physicians um, with hospital backing when there is another state regulation that actually says that certified nurse midwives have uh, independent practice. So um, there's some contradiction and there's just a lot of things that add um, cost and time and, and really prohibit midwives and others from starting birth centers in this state. And so um, sadly, I think that's why there's one, but I feel really hopeful um, about our future, both here and across the country. I, I think, Alana, that we are like I, I, I have to believe so deeply in my bones that we are in a period where certainly in, in my children's lifetime, the majority of people will be, the majority of births and the majority of babies will be tended to by midwives. Mm. Right now, 99% of births in the Commonwealth, and I think it trends this way nationally, happen in hospital and tended, largely tended to by physicians. Mm. I have to believe that we are in a, a shift um, that will bring midwifery back um, to, to community and to be the primary source of maternity care. And, and in that, I believe we'll see more community birth centers. And so I think we're just in this tension right now where we're beginning to kind of like, I don't know, crack through the soil and, and try to acknowledge, you know, the, the policy 
um, context and the and the policy changes that need to happen, not just on the regulatory side, but also with insurance, um, with hospitals, and really kind of, um, you know, I would say that we are in the mud, really kind of like wrestling through that right now, but that um, I think change is on the horizon. Folks who want to take action to support this work or to push forward um, good outcomes for birthing people, uh, who want to push forward uh, community-centered health, um, what can folks do? What are some action steps folks can take, either small or large, from your point of view? Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief. I think that one is um, just remembering that we are um, experts in our own bodies. And I think that um, remembering that for ourselves and holding that mirror up for the loved ones in our lives is really important. Um, and so for folks who are pregnant, looking to become pregnant, seeking abortion, um, you know, having people around you that believe in, uh, in your power can really change while you're navigating systems that, that um, thrive by actually uh, not supporting your power. And then on a bigger scale, um, policy. We put out policy action alerts, Bay State Birth Coalition does as well. They're our policy partner. Again, I feel really hopeful about this moment in time. There are several bills right now that would um, advance equitable access to uh, community midwives, that would um, change those state regulations, that would pay midwives better. And so again, we are um, hopeful. And so I'd invite folks to kind of follow along on the um, policy landscape with us. And then lastly, we are in a capital campaign. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say um, we are, you know, essentially selling bricks and t-shirts trying to open this birth center because again, um, you know, we're, uh, we're not turning to individual midwives to finance it. We're looking to community and to philanthropy. Um, and we are hearing back that there's a lot of um, resonance mm. and um, folks are really excited. And so those are the action steps I would invite folks to. Thank you so much for sharing um, this window into a piece of community health that leads to a stronger sense of well-being for our neighborhoods and for our city. We really appreciate the work you're doing and are excited to see how it grows over the next year and beyond. Um, thank you again, Nishira. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Alana. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming for sure. <laughs> What's next with you? What's next with you? What's next with you? A big thank you to all the artists and activists who helped create In Community We Trust. You can find more information about the participants in this event via the links in the chat and on our website. They're working towards a better future. And as we come to an end, please consider making a donation to Company One Theater in order to support future events like these, as we continue to build community at the intersection of art and social change. Your support really matters to us. To donate, please visit companyone.org slash donate. You'll also find that link and our Venmo handle in the description of this video. We also encourage you to support our community partners Visit Comfort Kitchen in Boston's Upham's Corner once they're open for regular service. Check out Neighborhood Birth Center's Impact Report and Capital Campaign to bring their vision to life. And help Bagley continue to provide safe, healthy gathering spaces for Boston's queer and trans youth with a donation of money or time. And finally, if you're inspired and ready to take action, Check out our event page, which is also linked in the video description for a list of resources and steps that you can take in your community and within your own circles. We hope you'll join us in this work in care and in good health. From all of us, thanks. Sun feels like gold on my skin. I win another day to 